Okay, welcome back. And what we're going to do uh, right now is we're going to spend just a little bit of time going through uh, some automata basics. So I wanted to get us like started uh, on this. We already had gone through kind of a, hopefully something that motivated you to, uh, or at least will partially motivate you to wanting to learn this stuff. But we're going to get started today on some uh, basics of automata and formal languages. And specifically, what we're going to start out with here is this uh, some definitions and some things that we can are, are going to use a lot throughout this semester. So the first one uh, is a set. And what a set is, uh, a set's a collection of unique elements. So in other words, you can't have duplicates in a set, uh, but it's just a collection of those. And those elements in that set can be really anything. It can be numbers, they can be uh, something more abstract. They could be other sets. You could have sets of sets. Um, and it's just a collection of elements. So in, in our case, we would say something like S is a set, and then X is an element, an element of set S. So the way that we would write that is X, and then this like sideways E looking thing, that's element of S. So if you see this, X that thing and then s, that's the way you would read that is x is an element of s. So x element s. That means that x is an item that's inside of that collection of uh, elements. So we can define a set using curly braces like we do down here. So s, this set s is equal to 0, 1, 2. And notice that that implies that that set consists of 0 being an element of set s one being an element of that set, and two being an element of that set. Nothing else is in that set. So we've defined this set to have three elements, zero, one, and two. All right, so pretty simple. And if you've had discrete math, or uh, I guess maybe in uh, junior high or whenever you look at some uh, basic set theory stuff, some of this will seem familiar to you, but we're going to kind of cover it anyway. We're going kind of from ground zero here, so I'm not going to assume everybody knows that that is element of, but now you should. Now, ellipses, uh, which are basically the dot, dot, dot. So this is an ellipses here. This, oop, let me come back. So that dot, dot, dot is the ellipsis. But that is, can be used where the meaning's clear. So in this case, for example, set one, A, B, dot, 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 Z would include C, D, E, F, G. So the entire lowercase alphabet here. And notice here, one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. That goes on infinitely, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so forth infinitely. And notice that in our definition of set back here, it didn't say it had to be finite. It can be infinite. It's just a collection of unique elements. So in this case, even though that's infinite, it's okay for that to still be uh, called a set. Notice that we can use multiple ellipses like we have here. This is it ranges from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now, one of the things uh, that's important to note is don't use the ellipses, uh, the dot, 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 when the meaning is not clear. So in other words, Making a set like this, one, B, hello, dot, 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 that doesn't, what's next in that sequence? You can't really tell. Up here, you can tell. The pattern is kind of established. We go from this one to the next one to the next one, dot, dot, dot. So don't do that. And then down here, if you just, if you don't establish a pattern, you just say zero, dot, 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 or you just put in curly braces, dot, 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 absolutely not. Don't do that. That doesn't tell me what that is. So you might know what you mean but other people are not. So we have to be clear uh, in our meaning when, if we're going to use that ellipses. Now, there's another way we can uh, define sets, and that's with these uh, curly braces. And those curly braces are what are uh, in a different, but we're using them in a different way. This is called a set former notation, or set former notation. And so in other words, the way this is, we're saying set S is defined as the set, in this case, of all x such that x is greater than 0 and x is even. So notice that when we read this, there's some specific meanings here. This colon is such that, and the comma is and. So in other words, this is set s as any element that's bigger than 0 and also even. So in other words, this is a set of all positive integers uh, that are even numbers, so all positive even integers. So if we were to do this with the uh, 
other notation using the ellipsis. Notice that this is, this is infinite because there's an infinite number of those, but this would be, for example, 2, comma, 4, comma, 6, comma, 8, comma, dot, dot, dot. So this is all uh, even numbers that are positive. But notice that that set former notation, we're going to see that a lot. Okay, now set operations. Uh, there are a few operations we're going to look at uh, today. We're going to look at more of them uh, later on. We're going to use them throughout the semester. But the first one is if we have two sets, in this case set 1 and set 2, S1 and S2, then the first one we can define as union. So the union operation is we take all of the elements from S1, we take all of the elements from S set S2, when we combine them together to make a new set. And that new set uh, still won't have any duplicates. So in other words, if there's a, uh, an element in S1 that's also in S2, it only shows up once in the result. So in other words, we combine all of the unique ones, to, all of the ones in here together into a big pot and throw out any ones that are duplicates. And that's the result. Now, the formal definition of, for this using set former would be the union of set 1 with set 2, or S1 union S2, is all x such that x is either in S1 or, and this is an inclusive or, meaning that it could be in both of them, but it has to be in this one or it's in that one. So this is all elements that are either in set 1 or they're in set 2 or they're in both. And so that makes sense. We're just throwing them all together into one big pot. Now, the intersection is kind of the opposite. It's the ones that are have to be in both of them, both sets. So set one, this uh, shape like that is the intersection symbol. So set one intersect S2. It has to be exist in both to end up in the intersection. So in other words, where do these sets overlap? What elements do they have in common? And the formal kind of set former notation for that would be all elements X, such that X is either in S1, or it's X is in S1, and it's also in uh, set S2. So X, notice here, has to be in both set 1 and set 2, and then it ends up in the intersection of those. Now there's another one here, and that's the difference. Uh, an easy way to think about the difference is any of them that are in both of them, we take away from the first one in the difference. So in other words, set 1 minus set 2 is doing a set difference, where we're taking elements of set 2 that overlap ones in set 1, and we take them out of set 1. And the formal definition here, using the set former is all x such that x is in set 1, but it's not in set 2 because we took all of those out. And it's not in set 2. So that will leave only ones in set 1 that are not also represented in set 2. Okay, the complement of a set. Now that's denoted by putting a, that vertical bar over the top of that uh, some defined set. And what the complement of a set is, is kind of like the, you can think of it as the opposite of that set. But how do you have the opposite of a set? And in order to, for that to make sense, we need to either know or define or have it be understood that we have some universal set. And what universal set is kind of uh, represented as is this U like that. That's the universal set. So we have to either define that or have it be understood in some way. And that's, think of the universal set as a set of all possible elements. So if we're dealing, uh, for example, with uh, real numbers as the universal set, any possible number that's a real number, then it, it, that could be something we could take a complement of, like, let's say, the positive numbers. What's the complement of the positive numbers? It'd be the zero and the negative numbers. What's the complement of zero? It would be the positive and the negative real numbers. You could do that with integers, you could define. So, but for the complement to make sense, we have to define or under, have understood what the universal set is. So that you, uh, we're going to see that sometimes, we'll define it sometimes. Sometimes it'll be understood. When you're dealing with numbers, a lot of times it's like the, the real numbers. Later on, we're going to use it in language uh, for languages, but we'll talk about that when we get there. Okay, so anyway, with U specified, the formal definition of that is the complement of S is all elements X such, and you don't have to use X, so you can use A and B or Y or whatever you want. This is just like a variable. So all elements X such that 
x is in the universal set, but it's not in the uh, set we're taking the complement of. So in other words, we're taking the opposite of this is everything that's not in this that's in the universal set, but we throw out the ones that are in that set. So it's like uh, taking the opposite or a negative image of that set. But we need to know what does everything else look like in order for that to make sense. All right, another concept that we're going to see throughout the semester, the empty set. The empty set is simply put a set that has no elements in it. So, and that sometimes that's called the null set or empty set. And this brings up an important point, is one of the things that you're going to see throughout the semester is when I introduce a certain concept or certain symbol, if there are alternate uh, definitions or meanings or terms for that, I'll try to present both of them, but then I'll focus on using one throughout the semester to avoid confusion. But the reason I'll present both is if you go on the internet or you're on Wikipedia or you find some book, sometimes they'll call it the null set. And that means the same thing as the MP set. So I just want you to be exposed to those things. So when you find online uh, content as you're doing your homework or researching things or reading about this stuff, that you're not confused by that. Like, what's the null set? Well, it's the same thing as the MP set. Now, same thing with kind of notation. There are two ways of writing the null set. One is this kind of uh, circle with a line through it. And the other one is empty curly braces. So notice that that empty set, these two... These two things mean the same thing. It's a set that has no elements in it. There's nothing in it. It's a collection of nothing. It has zero items. It's still a set. It just doesn't have to have uh, any items in it. And I apologize if uh, there's distraction, but there's a, a, a kitten who's getting kind of large now running around. And so if you hear uh, crazy noises in the background, it's the cat's fault. It might also try to get in my lap or climb up and get in the camera, so just watch out for that. If you see me looking off to the side and being distracted, it's probably because the cat is wreaking havoc somewhere. All right, so anyway, uh, continue. this is kind of remote learning problems that we wouldn't have if we were face-to-face -face in the classroom, hopefully. All right, so a couple things to note here. Uh, if we take a set and union it with the empty set, it's the same as the set we started with. In other words, uh, adding zero elements to that set gives you the same thing you started with. Same thing with difference. If we take the uh, a set and we subtract nothing from it, we get the same set we started with. The complement of the empty set is the universal set. The complement of the universal set is the empty set. And here, the complement of the complement of a set is the set itself. And that makes sense if you think about the, the complement is the opposite or the, the negative of it. Uh, think of like a photographic negative. If you take a photograph, you make a negative of it, and then you make a negative of that, you're back to having the thing you started with. And so those are a couple things to note uh, based on what we've learned so far. Okay, here are some interesting set properties that if you take the complement of set one union with set two, that's the same, it's equivalent to the intersection of the complement of set one intersected with the complement of set two. And those at first uh, glance don't seem intuitive, uh, but it is. So in other words, you can represent a union that the entire thing is complemented with an intersection of the two things being complemented individually. And it works the other way too. If you have two things that are intersected, you can complement that whole thing, and that's equivalent to a complement of one, a complement of other, and then union those. And those are called De Morgan's Laws. Uh, we'll come back and we'll see those later on. Don't worry about too much why that works or why that is. Uh, if you want to draw a little picture for yourself, uh, you can see why that works. But it's actually a pretty cool thing that allows us to uh, convert unions into intersections or intersections into unions. In certain cases, we can make things easier by doing that. All right. A little bit of other uh, notation. The, this first one here, this thing that looks like a sideways U with a line under it, that's called subset. So S1 subset S2. And what that means is that S1 is a subset of S2. That means that S1 has only elements that are in set 2. And it, set 1 could be the same as set 2. So this is the same as it's a subset or it's equal to that. So there can't be elements in set one that are not part of set two 
or it would not be a subset. So in other words, if you take the collection set two, you would take zero or more things away and to form set one, if it's the subset of that. Now there's another uh, notation here, which is that same sideways U looking thing, but without the line underneath it, and that's the proper subset. And the only difference between those two is this still has fewer items than set two, but it can't be the same. So this has to have fewer items than set two does. Now, if two sets have no common elements, the, there's a term for that is disjoint. So in other words, if set one intersect, uh, that should be set two. That's a typo there. So if set one intersect set two is an empty set, then set one and set two are disjoint sets. So disjoint just means they have no intersection. There's no overlap between them. They're completely, every element is unique to only those ones and is not in the other one. Okay, the size of a set. The size of a set is represented with these vertical bars around the set. So this would indicate the size of set S. Now what does the size mean? That just means how, if you count up the number of elements in it, how many are there? So how many things are in that set? Well, we can denote that with these vertical bars around the name of the set or the, the set. Now, sizes of sets can be finite, could be zero, could be one, could be two, could be some other arbitrarily large finite number, or they could be infinite. So we could have sets that have an infinite number of elements like uh, the integers uh, or the real numbers. But we could also have sets that are like binary digits, zero and one. That's clearly finite. It only has two things, has a zero, has a one. We could have a set that has like the lowercase letters of the alphabet. That would be a length of 26. But this notation gives us the length. All right, now this one's probably one that uh, you haven't seen before. Maybe you've seen all the other stuff, but this one, maybe not. But the, the power set. And what the power set is, it's the set of all possible subsets of a given set. And the notation for that is two with a superscript uh, set, S. So this two to the S, the way you would read that is the power set of S. Now, the best way that I can uh, explain this or illustrate this is probably with this example here. And the example here, I gave, I'm giving this set, has three elements, A, B, and C. That's my defined set. What does the power set look like? What's well, the set of all possible subsets? In other words, if I take zero or more things away from this, what are all the ways I could do that to get a new set? Well, one of them, I could take all of them away. That would give me the empty set here. One of them I could take the B and C away and leave just A. One of them I could take the A and C away and leave just B. One of them I could take the A and B away and leave just C. And then I could, so that's where I took all three elements. This is where I took two of them away. And then these ones over here where I take one away, take away the B or the C, leave just A and B. Take away the B, leave A and C. Take away the A, leave B and C. And then I could not take any of them away because I said take away zero or more. So this is, uh, notice it doesn't say, proper subsets, so we could have the set itself be one of those subsets, so we have to have where we take none of them away. So we took away zero, or one, or two, or three, and that leaves this. And one thing to note, why is this the notation? Why is this weird two to that uh, set? Why is that the no notation for it? And that's because if you take the length of that set, it's three, and if you say what's the length of two to the s, well it's two to the three, which is going to be eight. So if we count up how many elements, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And if you're writing out uh, power sets like that, it's always good to double check. That way you can see if you missed any. That's like, I know the power set of, this has three elements. So the power set is going to be, uh, have the two to the three elements. So two to the three is eight. So I can count and make sure they're all there. And I got them all. And this power set thing is going to come in useful for us here. Uh, in formal languages uh, very shortly. It might seem like a strange thing to do, but it's actually fairly useful because it gives us a way to represent all of the possible kind of subsets of that. It gives us a way to say, this is all of the things we could do with these elements uh, in forming possible things that are subsets of that. We'll see where that uh, comes in useful in a second. All right, set equivalents. Two sets are called equivalent or equal if they have the same elements. And one other thing to note is that the order doesn't matter. So in other words, if we go back to this page here, 
set ABC is equivalent to CAB is equivalent to the BCA and so forth. So in other words, order does not matter uh, in two sets. So ABC is the same as BAC or CBA or any of those possible orderings. And the way we write that is just with an equal sign. So S1 equals S2. That says S1 is equivalent or equal to set 2. Now formally, set 1 and set 2 are equivalent if set 1 is a proper or is a subset of set 2 and set 2 is also a subset of set 1. The only way that that can be true, that they both are subsets of each other, is if they're the same set. Another way we could look at that formally is to say that set 1 minus set 2, if we take all of the elements of set 2, or elements of set 2 away from set 1 and it leaves nothing left, and then we switch them and take all of the set 1 away from set 2 and it leaves nothing, the only possibility is they're, they're the same set. They have the same um, elements in them. All right, so that's all for today. We have a little bit of definition. We're going to start using those definitions next class where we dig into, since this is automata and formal languages, we're going to get a definition next class for what is a language. And in this class, that's going to be a little bit uh, different than probably what you used to. You used to think of language like English or Spanish, or maybe you used to like Java or C++ or JavaScript or Python. In this class, uh, formal languages, the word language has a very specific definition. But even though that definition is very specific, it's also very abstract and it's very uh, meaning that it's usable for a lot of different uh, situations. So don't think of it as language like uh, you would traditionally think of it. And we'll dig into the formal definition of that next class. And then we're going to start looking at some languages and how we can create those languages. And then that's going to lead us to these machine models that represent those languages for us. All right, so we'll go ahead and stop there. Uh, everybody stay safe. Uh, and uh, one thing to do, make sure to check the uh, course site at class time because I will be posting quizzes um, regularly in this class more than you're used to having in the other classes. All right, so stay safe and I'll see you next time.